Romans, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. All things are ready if our minds be so. All that glitters is not gold. Brevity is the soul of wit. And if a uh, thief. Uh, if music be the food of love, play, play on. on. A horse, my kingdom for a horse. A kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to hold the swelling scene. Do the word to the action, the action to the word. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Of course, the true love ever did run smooth. Lord, what fools these mortals be. To be or not to be. Thine own self be true. We are such stuff as dreams are made of. That our little lives are rounded with a sleep. Trip away, make no stay. Meet me all by break of day. All the world's a stage. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm. And all the men and women merely play it. We few. We happy few. All's well that ends well. The play's the thing. Admit us, chorus, to this history. Who prologue like your humble patience pray. Here. Kindly to judge our, our play. play. Gentle folks, here are the Majeska Shakespeare players. We are bringing you Shakespeare here, here. Shakespeare there, here. Shakespeare here. everywhere. <laughs> Elena Majeska was the ambassador of Shakespeare to California. Renowned throughout America and Europe, the greatest actress of her time traveled to boom towns and mining colonies across our fledgling state, bringing with her the greatest dramatic poetry the English language has to offer. And here at her stated art, we carry on the tradition. Without elaborate sets or giant spectacle. We tell the light, because all you really need to bring Shakespeare to an audience are the words. Words, words, words. words. So join us on this tour of some of the immortal characters, unforgettable moments, and the glorious language of William Shakespeare. The Bard is back at Arden, and we thank you for reviving this tradition. And now, it is time to play. Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Carey Martin, standing in for Nicholas Sir Kettle, who has been arranging us the last few years. You may have noticed we haven't been here for a particular reason that you may be familiar with. And it just so happens that our fearless leader, Nick Sir Kettle, has also fallen ill with COVID. He'll be back next time. He's doing fine. He's great. Um, wishing us well from afar. So, today I would just like to thank uh, Art in the House and everybody here, the House Foundation. Um, I would like to thank uh, the docents, the volunteers, the OC Parks. And what I'd like to do is introduce our newest member standing in for Nick, Jeff Lowe. Look at that, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Jill mentioned, my name is Jeff Lowe. I am but a poor facsimile of the fantastic Nicholas Third Kettle. As some of you might know, this place is called Ar uh, Arden in honor of As You Like It, one of Shakespeare's beloved comedies featuring Rosalind, one of Madame Majeska's favorite heroines. Now, in the play, the Duke and his followers have been overthrown and banished to the forest by one of Shakespeare's recurring themes that is casting off your privilege and you rediscover your humanity. And that nature is our truly our greatest teacher, which is appropriate seeing as how Shakespeare was from the country and not one of London's elites. Now, in times of strife, it is a rare privilege to return to our roots. To commune with nature is a natural human desire, because what can speak to truth better than nature, which is always true to herself? May we all find the time to listen to the trees, read the running rivers, and commend our bones to the stones of history, and to find truth in truth. And so I say to you now, my co-mates and brothers in exile, has not old custom made this life more sweet? Are not the trees more free of peril than the envious court? Feel we hear not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference, as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which when it bites and blows upon my body, and even till I shrink with cold, I say and smile. This is not flattery. These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity. 
which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this, our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Would not change. of Venice was the first play that I ever read of Shakespeare, 14 years old. At 15 years old was the first play I ever saw of Shakespeare. And then the first m speech I ever memorized from Shakespeare. So if, if you remember The Merchant of Venice, it takes place in Venice. And if you've been to Venice, you know the famous Rialto Bridge that's there, uh, which was just like it was during Shakespeare's time. So the two adversaries, Shylock and Antonio, meet to discuss a loan that Antonio needs for his friend Bassanio. And this is Shylock's rationale. And I have to say that it was the character of Shylock that turned me on to the humanity of Shakespeare. Um, so this is Act One, Scene Three, Signor Antonio. Many a time and oft in the Rialto you have rated me on my monies and my usances. Still I have borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me believer, cutthroat, dog. You spit upon my Jewish cabadine and all the use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Don't you then you come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have money. You say so. You that would void your room upon my beard and foot me as you would spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Money's is your suit. <laughs> what should I say to you, huh? Should I not say if the dog money? Is it not possible that a cur could lend 3,000 ducats? Shall I bend low in a bondsman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this? Fair sir, you spat upon me Wednesday last. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I shall lend you thus much money? That's shot. Thank you. In Shakespeare's day, something happened in Europe called the plague, <laughs> and it would come through. And then it would go away, and it would come through again. They'd close the theaters every time. I know that that has never happened here in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> and what writers would do when they were not able to write for the theater, they wrote sonnets, 14-line poems. They rhymed. And so they kept their writing skills sharp. Now, Shakespeare, in his sonnets, was often writing uh, to a person, so they say. Um, the sonnet I'm going to read to you seems to be, to me, about a little bit more than just writing to a beautiful youth. But indeed, he's talking about the ephemeral nature of beauty anyway. And uh, this is sonnet, this is bus. Since brass. No stone, no earth, no boundless sea, but sad mortality or sways their power. How with this rage shall beauty hold a plea whose action is no stronger than a flower? 
Oh, how shall summer's honey breath hold out against the wreckful siege of battering days? When rocks impregnable are not so stout, nor gates of steel so strong, but time decays. Oh, fearful meditation. Where, alack, shall time's best jewel from time's chest lie hid? Or what strong hand can hold his swift foot back, or who his spoil of beauty can forbid? Oh, none. Unless this miracle have might, that in black ink my love may still shine bright. from the history Richard II, which is a uh, harrowing story about the downfall of a powerful man. Um, in it, in the speech I'm about to perform, King Richard II um, discovers that a rebellion from his rival, Boilingbroke, has succeeded, and he will soon have to surrender to his rival. And he is essentially losing all of his power. And in this, a king, who is a man who not only conducts death and life itself, he compares that to what it is to just be a man. He learns a hard, hard lesson in humanity as well as humility in this speech. So here we go. Of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. Make dust our paper and with rainy eyes write sorrow in the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills, but yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lives, our lands, and all are boiling brooks. And nothing we can call our own save our deposed bodies to the ground. <laughs> N nothing we can call our own but death. <laughs> and that little model of barren earth which serves as pace and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let's... Sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown which rounds the mortal temples of king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, Allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize. He feared and killed with looks, infusing him with a self and vain conceit, as if this flesh and blood with walls about our lives were brass impregnable. And humored thus, comes at the last with a little pin, breaches his castle wall, and farewell, king. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty. For you have mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? Thank you. You know what I read? I really like this. It's so familiar. Oh, well, you should know. I read at our wedding. No, I'm kidding. That was <laughs> So. Here we go, 116. Let me not to the marriage true mind admit impediments. Love is not love which alters what it alteration finds, or bends what the remover to remove. Oh no. It is a fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star of every wandering bark whose worth's unknown although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool. The rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proof, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. 
wonderful battle of the sexes. Um, and this scene I'm about to perform, Lord Barone, uh, is lamenting how lovesick he is. If any of you have ever felt lovesick, you know, reason and rationality tend to go out the window. And he sees himself as a very, he's a very boastful and egotistical intellectual, so he's wrestling with how, how could he possibly be in love? <coughs> And I, forsooth in love, I, who have been love's whip, a very beetle to a humorous sigh, a critic, nay, a night watch constable, a domineering paint over the boy, then no mortal so magnificent, this wimpled, whining, pure blind, wayward boy, this senior junior giant dwarf, Don Cupid, regent of love rhymes, Lord of folded arms, anointed sovereign of sighs and groans, liege of all loiterers and malcontents, dread prince of plackets, king of cod pieces, sole imperator and great, great general of trotting parators. Oh, my little heart. And I to wear his colors and stand in his field like a tumbler's hoop. Oh, what? I love, I sue. I seek a wife, a woman who is like a German clock, still repairing, ever out of frame, never going right, being a watch, but still being a watch that may go right. Nay, be perjured, which is worst of all, and among three, to love the worst of all. A whitely wanton with a velvet brow and two pitch balls stuck to her face for eyes. And I sigh for her, I wait for her, I pray for her. Oh, go to! It is a plague that Cupid would impose for my neglect of his almighty dreadful little might. Well, I will write, sigh, pray, sue, and groan. Some men must love my lady, some men... Joan. Thank you. And again, Tom Braddock. number in the late 70s at Orange Coast College. <clears throat> and they asked me to play in there, uh, which rekindled my desire and joy for, for Shakespeare. As you know, King Lear divides his kingdom in three. He's approaching 80, and as I'm now approaching that myself, getting up there, um, he gives his kingdom away with the expectation that his daughters are going to take care of him. And his hundred nights, which he just happens to bring along with him. So this is, uh, Donald has just kicked him out of her home. And this is his response. Hear nature! Hear, dear goddess, hear! To spend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in her the organs of increase, and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must teem, let her child be of spleen, that it may live and be a thwart distempered torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth with Canaan tears for channels in her cheeks, so that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Away! Away! Thank you. Yeah. Now, The Tempest was the first Shakespeare I got to see way back in Connecticut. They did um, a Shakespeare festival. Uh, just outside the city of Stratford. Um, they did a beautiful festival. The uh, theater was very much like the global thing. I believe it was indoors. I don't remember anymore. It's no longer there. The actual building burned down. Very, very sad. But I did see The Tempest. My grandmother took me, and it was my first Shakespeare. And all I can really recall is that I fell in love with Ariel, who was in some sort of bodysuit, all glittery and beautiful and whatever. But I'm, we're going to do a little scene um, from Act 5, scene 1. Prospero has been um, exiled to an island. 
where he is raping his daughter, Miranda, and um, seething with vengeance on the people who have put him there. Um, he's been deposed. He was the Duke. He was deposed. And he's taken the opportunity to capture the people who um, banished him and wreaking all sorts of havoc, a storm, called the Tempest, and so on, using all the um, beasts and characters of nature that are upon the island, calling upon all those creatures. And this, in this scene, he realizes that perhaps vengeance is not the thing that should be embraced, that it's mercy, that it's divine. As I was reading it uh, and trying to learn it, uh, I said to Nick, who chose it for me, that it seems to me a very, a role that really works for you if you're a woman. And although Helena Modesto would not have played this role in her day, you are seeing more women take on this kind of role and other roles in Shakespeare because Shakespeare is talking to humanity and all these qualities are very human. What Prospero finds is that mercy is what is most human. This is Act 5, Scene 1. Look there. Now does my project gather to a head. My charms crack not. Spirits obey, and time is upright. Carriage. How's the day? On the sixth hour? At which time, my lord, you said our work should cease? I did say so when first I raised the tempest. Estate, my spirit, how fares the king and his followers? Confined together, in the same fashion you left in charge. Just as you left them, all prisoners, sir, in the lime grove, which weather fends your cell. They cannot budge till your release. King, his brother, and yours. Abide all three distracted, and the remainder mourning over them, brim full of sorrow and dismay. But chiefly, him who you turn, sir, the good old Lord Gonzalez, his tears run down his beard like winter's drops on me. Charm so strongly works them that if now you beheld them, your affections would become tender. Does that think so, spirit? Mine would, sir, were I human. And mine shall. Art thou, which art but air a touch, a feeling of their afflictions, and shall not myself, one of their kind, that Relish all as sharply passion as they be kindly are moved than thou art. Though with the high wrongs I am struck to the quick yet, is my nobler reason against my fury who I take part. The rarer action is in virtue than in virtues. They being penitent, Soul drift of my purpose doth extend not a frown further. So release the Mario. My charms I'll break. Their senses are restored. And they shall be content. I'll fetch them, sir. Standing lakes and groves. And ye that on the sand with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back. And you, Demi Puppet, <laughs> that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make, whereof you do not bite. And you, whose pastime is 
used to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew. By whose aid? Sweet master, so you be, I have bedimmed the noontime sun. Called forth the mutinous winds in which the green sea and the azure vault that roaring war. To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire and rifted Joe's stout oak with his own bolt. The strong base promontory have I made ship, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Grace at my command of wake this sleeper's oak. Let him forth by my so This rough magic I hear of your. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do to work my end upon the senses that this airy charm is for. I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound out around my back. Experience, and I want to thank Nick Perkettle again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I would like to thank the House, the House Foundation, docents, staff, volunteers, and OC Parks uh, for, uh, you know, that we have a special performance also at uh, Irvine Regional Park on October 1st to celebrate the park's 125th anniversary. Please follow us on Facebook to learn more. Also, if you find yourself in driving distance of Diamond Bar, we have two performances left of A Midsummer Night's Dream, directed by our very own Jill Carey Martin. And ask Jill and myself uh, for any more info. We don't bite unless provoked. As for our final piece, Oberon is the king of the fairies and other magical creatures of the wild. A Midsummer Night's Dream, like many Shakespeare comedies, ends with multiple weddings, three, in fact. And uh, in special, this special blessing, Oberon appears in the Duke, home of Duke Theseus and instructs his creatures to spread magical good fortune to the bedchambers of the newly wedded couples and their children to come, free from abnormalities like being turned into a donkey, right? And with that, we offer our blessing to everyone who has shared with us today in Arden. May you all be blessed by nature, knowledge, art, and then return of live theater. We give this blessing unto you freely, and to my fairies say, now until the break of day, every fairy in this house straight away. And to the best bride bed will we, which by us shall blessed be. And so shall the couples three ever in loving be, and the Blots of nature's hand shall not upon their issue stand. Never mole, nor hair lip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious, such as are despised in the tibby, shall upon their children be. With this field do consecrate, through this house blessed be, with sweet peace. Fairies, take your gate, and through this house cons consecrate. We'll trip away, make no stay. Meet me all by breaking.